first question is from uh, blogger Chris DeMauro from mm -hmm. Gas 2.0. And he would like to know how Ford plans to promote sustainability in racing. Might we see an E85 capable 5 liter V8 in the Mustang GT down the road? He'd really like to hear about this as he likes his muscle cars as much as he is a fan of alternative fuels. Oh, so that's, that, that is a good question. I, I can't say that we have something specific going on right now, but, but we do have our racing team, you know, has contacted us because there's been other interest in terms of the, you know, sustainable racing. So we're just starting to engage in conversations of, you know, what would that look like if it's from a, uh, you know, maybe EcoBoost versions of high performance vehicles to using um, ethanol. So there is another concept of, from a sustainable standpoint in racing, can we be using ethanol and how would that look? Uh, so so that, that's another element to just kind of pure electric. So we're, we're starting to have those conversations, nothing to really talk specifically about right now, but it's good to hear that there's others on the outside that are also interested in sustainability in racing. So thank you. Great, now, now we've got some questions from some of our Facebook fans. The first is from Kevin Robinson and he asks, any chance we'll get more super fuel efficient cars in the U.S. soon, especially ones made here? Yeah, so we actually, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, we actually have a, uh, one of our Fiestas is a super fuel efficient uh, Fiesta that gets 41, 40 miles per gallon. So um, one of the real keys here is that we, we really want to, in Europe, We've actually, there's actually been a demand for these super fuel efficient vehicles uh, for quite a while right now. And in Europe, we actually have products that we label Econetic. So you have the Econetic version of different vehicles because customers are asking, they've been asking over there for exactly that. What are the super fuel efficient versions that we could offer here? So we've done that with the Fiesta. Um, I, I think that that trend now is just going to continue with uh, some of our other products. So you, you should be seeing that coming. Uh, Chris Hilder asks, with fuel prices greatly swinging over the past two years, what baseline price for fuel does Ford use to develop its future portfolio? Yeah, great question, Chris. So that's that's one of the, the million dollar questions that I guess asked right within the four walls of Ford. It's that, you know, who has the best guess on, you know, where um, fuel prices are going to go? I guess one of the things that we determine that no matter what we guess, the one thing that's going to be assured is that we're going to guess wrong. Not only are we going to guess wrong in terms of where fuel prices are going, but we'll probably guess wrong in terms of what, how customers are going to react to the fuel prices. We think, you know, typically they're going to want more fuel efficiency, smaller vehicles. But we didn't want to get into a game that, you know, as you see these wild swings in fuel prices, in many cases based upon the external environment and the problem areas of the world, that we're always adjusting what vehicles designed to. So what we've done instead is, so we have this full portfolio of vehicles that are highly fuel efficient. What we've decided to do is to make sure that we have flexibility in our manufacturing so that regardless of where fuel prices go, if we have flexibility in our manufacturing, I can mix manage very quickly from one size vehicle to another. So that's how we're addressing it. Not trying to look into a crystal ball and saying, all right, what if gas prices go to $5, what does it mean? We're gonna be a full line manufacturer. We're gonna have flexibility in our manufacturing. It's gonna allow us to switch from one vehicle to another vehicle quickly based upon where fuel prices go and what customers are demanding. Next question is from Casey Popliars. We all know that you can achieve much higher mile MPG than what you are producing. Why not make a V8 that can get 30 miles per gallon? <laughs> That's Casey. Thank you for the question. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I know that we do get that question often that, hey, are you guys holding back on, on anything? And, you know, the bottom line is we're really not holding back on anything because obviously, as I mentioned, you know, as we, the reason we want to be leadership in fuel economy in every segment that we serve in is because customers value that, they're willing to pay for that. So it only makes sense, wow, if we could produce more fuel efficient vehicles, uh, we would do it or, or a higher level of fuel efficiency. So we're always looking at doing that. I think the challenge that we have out there, because you might hear, hey, some guy in his garage was able to jack up their fuel economy on their V8 to, you know, some, some ungodly number, and that's fantastic. We're always interested in better fuel economy. Our challenge is always the trade-off, right? So 
as you have better fuel economy, let's say with a V8 or with another engine, you know, are there any takeaways, right? I mean, are you reducing your, your amount of power? Are there increased amount of emissions? Is from an NVH, which is, you know, a vibration standpoint, are there problems? So that's typically what our holdback is, is trying to, set, you know, not degrade any of those other areas while we try to improve the fuel economy. But I'll tell you, right, if we are so looking for fuel economy improvements that there is no holding back. It's just a matter of making sure the customer isn't compromised in the other attributes of that product. Great. Next question is from Scott McGuire. He asks, would it be possible to make an EcoBoost V8? Yeah, I think technically it would be possible to make an EcoBoost V8, right? It's just direct injection and turbocharging. So there's nothing technically that, that prevents us from doing that. Um, again, as, as an approach standpoint, what we look at, you know, from a from a company uh, perspective is, you know, what is the, the the market that's out there that's going to demand, let's say, that type of a product. And once we get enough input that says, hey, you know, there is a market out there. It doesn't have to even be huge, right? It could be a niche market. If there is a market out there for getting signals that 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 type of product makes sense, we're always interested in understanding how we could deliver a product like that. So again, it's these types of inputs, which is just another data source to say, what are the areas we should be thinking about that we're not playing in right now? But outside of that, uh, nothing to announce. Great. Um, Alan Allison asks, why does America not have diesel models? Alan, okay, very good question. And I know when I go over to Europe and I talk to my European colleagues at Ford, they say, how come you don't have diesel models in, in the US? Because diesel is, it's, it's, a, it's a great technology. Um, you have, Alan, you've probably driven diesel diesel cars. I've driven them in, in Europe. They're, they're phenomenal. A couple of challenges here in the U.S. with regard to diesel. Number one, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contrast it to Europe. Um, Europe, number one, uh, their diesel uh, prices, they're, they're, they're the prices for diesel at the pump are less than gasoline. So, so basically they uh, provide incentives to, the governments provide incentives to buy diesel over gasoline. So, so diesel is cheaper. And with gas and diesel prices, but gas prices in particular, petrol prices in Europe being so high, uh, people are very interested. And again, they're, they're buying with their pocketbook that, man, if I could get use a fuel that costs less and gets a better fuel economy, I'm going to buy that, that, that particular fuel. So big demand for the diesels over in Europe because of that. Um, you know, the diesel vehicles do cost more, but the customers do see that payback. The challenge we have in the U.S. is that in most places throughout the U.S., diesel prices for the fuel is more than gasoline. So you have this conundrum of the diesel vehicles are going to be more expensive, like they are in Europe. But now your payback, even though the fuel economy is better of a diesel versus a gasoline, because the diesel prices are higher, your payback is taking longer. And I think the American psyche, and probably just any consumer psyche, it's difficult of, if they're, if they're not going to do the calculation, geez, I'm going to buy this product that costs more money, and I have to buy a fuel that costs me more money, right? And if they've done the math, the, the payback will get there, but it's going to be much longer term than Europe. The other challenge that we have with diesel, just kind of taking a look forward, uh, vehicles, as, as everybody knows, have to meet emission requirements too. And when we look at the future emission requirements, particularly in the U.S., um, as, as it relates to allowable emissions, the diesel vehicles are going to be very challenged, particularly the, sm the smaller vehicles. The larger vehicles, we're going to get there, but the smaller vehicles are really going to be challenged in terms of being able to deliver to those levels. And the only way to deliver those levels is to put more cost into the products. And so that, that's going to make it up an affordability challenge. Great. Next question is from Brent Buell. And he asks, is an EcoBoost in the Mustang's future? Uh, so unfortunately, my role here is I cannot uh, talk about future product plans. So I, I can't comment on that. All I can say is the whole EcoBoost concept and approach is something that we're blowing across as many product lines as, as possible. So we're considering everything. Great. Scott Weinberg asks, is there any chance of a performance hybrid in Ford's future? I believe the Mustang V6 paired with hybrid tech could make for a mean over 40 mile per gallon machine. Okay, so that's like another question in terms of the EcoBoost uh, um, in, the, in the Mustang. So again, I can't comment on, on our future product plans, but again, you know, it really comes down to you know, every, every question that's being asked here, sure, there's discussions like that that go on at Ford all the time. You know, what, are the, what are the various 
um, um, options we could offer or configurations we could offer that we don't currently offer, right? It's all about how do we appeal to a larger marketplace. So can't announce anything right now, but all these concepts that are, are being talked about, you know, as we get a critical mass, as we're getting more and more input that a performance version of a hybrid makes sense or a, a, an EcoBoost version of another uh, of a V8 makes sense, right? As we, those are examples. As we get more and more input, then we start to say, hey, there could be a market out there that's worth going after. So we'll always be considering these types of options, but nothing to report right now. Great. Um, Landon Eastley asks, how can I get better mileage out of my 2005 Mustang V6? Gas is over four dollars a gallon. Our budgets cannot afford that for a long period of time. Help. Okay, so that's a lot of people ask the question around, you know, how they could get better gas. And I'm not just going to talk about the, the Mustang itself, but just any vehicle. A lot of folks have, you know, when I talk to them and say, and I say, hey, you know, you want to buy this great fuel efficient vehicle. They say, I, I can't afford a new vehicle right now. Can't you give me any tips on how I can get more fuel efficiency out of my current vehicle? And actually, there are a lot of tips. Um, we, we've actually published on our website uh, eco driving techniques. So these are techniques that if you stop and think about them, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, those will get me better fuel economy, but they really do. So it's things like, you know, having your windows rolled up if you're traveling over 50 miles an hour on the highway. You actually get better fuel economy going that route and having your air conditioning on versus having the windows down. That's a good example. Simple things like checking your tires. I know it seems, you know, mundane, but, you know, checking your tires, engine tune-ups, all of those elements, I'll tell you, really add to fuel economy improvements. Taking all that, you know, uh, stuff that you might have in your trunk out of your trunk, you know, if, you, if you're not needing it, again, reducing the weight. All these elements, you could see upwards 20, 25% improvement with the eco driving techniques that we've outlined. I didn't believe it just in terms of driving styles. I went on a course. And they told me, you know, you get 20% better fuel economy improvement. I said, yeah, no way. I know how to drive a vehicle. And I'll tell you what, we went through this course in terms of, you know, just being very conscious of when you're accelerating and decelerating, coming up to stoplight, stop signs, that type of thing. And I did. I got something like a 19% fuel economy improvement. So these tips are real. They could be used on any vehicle that you own right now. So I encourage people to go to our website with those eco-driving tips. Great. Next question is from Gary Zavitt. Uh, he asks, in light of the Focus electric launch this year, what is Ford's five-year vision for gas hybrid electric vehicles? Equal development on all three, or is hybrid a bridging strategy to go fully electric? So that's 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 an interesting question. You know, if if um, first of all, we, we're we're going to be focused on delivering hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery electrics. You know, probably a larger percentage of hybrids versus the other two because, again, it just kind of gets back to the customer demand. But, you know, you have an, an interesting question in there. And, you know, when we talk about our electrified portfolio, I mentioned hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery electrics. And the reason I mention that is a lot of the technologies that are, that are, it, are part of the electrified pieces of the hybrid we could actually use for the plug-ins and the battery electrics. If it's the transaxles, if it's some of the battery technology, a lot of the electrical components span across really all three types of electrified vehicles. So the more volume we get, even in our hybrids, that's only going to improve our cost situation on plug-ins and battery electrics. It, it is a, uh, our strategy is to really optimize that technology that really covers all three areas of electrified vehicles. Next question is from Mark Small out of the UK, actually. He asks, why do Americans still want huge engine sizes? For example, why would you need a three liter V6 in a Fusion? A two liter is sufficient enough for a car that size. And I won't even start on the V8 pickup engines. We manage well with three liter inline four diesels here in the UK. Yeah, so it's a great question, Mark, and uh, I know my, my European colleagues ask me the same question. Why, why do we need everything so much bigger all the time, right? What's, what's the deal with that, particularly with engines? I, you know, I think that that mindset is shifting, I would say, you know, five, six years ago, maybe even sooner than that. It was all about, and I mentioned in the beginning of, of my talk, the fact that when we had um, uh, powertrain improvements, we just kind of plowed them into more horsepower, more cylinders, because there was like this insatiable appetite for that in the U.S. It was driven by the fact that unlike in England, 
our fuel prices were cheap, right? Energy was cheap, so buying gas didn't cost you anything. I might as well get the bigger version, the more horsepower version. So that, that kind of fed that mindset. What we're seeing now, particularly with the way gas prices are going, people are saying, you know something? I think I kind of have, this is the majority of the population now, I think I kind of have adequate performance. So yeah, I don't need more horsepower, more cylinders. What I really need is better fuel economy because I'm tired of spending a ton of money at the gas pump right now. So I think, Mark, what you're seeing is a shift. You know, it hasn't completely changed yet, but a shift in terms of the mindset of the American consumer to be more like the European consumers and not necessarily needing more in terms of their powertrains. Great. Um, Carl Warmington asks, why are the active shutters not standard features on all new 2012 Focus? So good, good, good question, um, Carl. The uh, the uh, you're, you're familiar with the active shutters. Something that we, we we do oftentimes at Ford is when we have a new technology. If it's active shutters, I mentioned electric power assisted steering. We'll start out by having it on one version of one model. And then you know get some experience with it, and then understand how we could uh, proliferate that into the other models. So it's more from an approach standpoint, right? We didn't we didn't necessarily in our approach wouldn't it be to come out with active shutters on every vehicle that we have right when active shutters are available, or come out with electric power assisted steering on every vehicle we have once it became available. We want to get some experience with it, number one. But secondly, you know, we have to get those parts from suppliers. And suppliers don't always have a great ability of going from nothing to millions of vehicles all at once. So I, I would say that this is our first step. And as it, we see it become effective, we, can see, we could potentially see it being expanded into to other products. Great. Now we'll move on to some of the questions that have come in uh, from the live stream from those okay. of you watching. Um, we have a couple here from Meow. The first one is, how are you incorporating LG into future plans for alternative fuel options, if at all? We also, that's, uh, uh, we're getting more into the research side. So one of the, uh, one of the pieces to our portfolio that I didn't mention is that uh, we do offer vehicles that run on ethanol, uh, so flex fuel vehicles as we call them, uh, and also biodiesel. And uh, um, we just, our, our new diesel engine in our Super Duty actually can accommodate up to 20% biodiesel or B20. And when we think about uh, what, could be, what could make up biodiesel, it could be vegetable oils or it could be, let's say, feedstock like from algae. So right now, with regard to algae, we have our scientists in our lab really trying to understand and working with universities, what are the prospects for algae? They look to be promising, but we need to go from a promising concept to be able to commercialize it and make it affordable. And I think we're kind of in that transition stage. But the real cool thing is when you think about algae, right? I mean, algae takes CO2 out of the air and you know it can be used as a feedstock for fuel. So lots of promise, um, I think, globally on LG as a fuel source. And just stay tuned. I, I think it's going to be a, a player in the future. Right. The, the second thing that Mia would like to know um, is if you could expand a little more on Ford's announcement um, of plug-in hybrid and, and the benefits of using it. So the, our announcement of pl a plug-in hybrid. So. Uh, for, for some customers, as I mentioned, the, the plug-in hybrid is, think about a hybrid that you plug in, it's, it's not going to have the same full range as a pure, pure battery electric. So it's going to go you know, a certain number of miles, 20, 30 miles, depending on your driving style, maybe a little bit more. And so the benefits are, if you're a customer that 95% of the time or 90% of the time, you, you, you could kind of pick the percentage, that really is only going to be going that distance. The advantage you have with a plug-in hybrid is that you're going to be, you're, the energy that you're using is off the battery during that period. So because, you know, electricity is a lot cheaper than gasoline, for you as a customer, that would be a very good vehicle because you're not actually using the engine all that often. So that's the benefit of a plug-in. It, it really gets back to what is the application that you have as a customer. And if your application is, I only occasionally need kind of the gasoline part of my vehicle because most of the time I'm just going to be driving a short number of miles, then a plug-in makes perfect sense for you. Next question is from Colby Green. 
Going forward, how will Ford tackle range anxiety issues with electric cars? Or is range anxiety merely just a marketing ploy? No, I think, you know, customers, it, it, you know, it depends, right? Certain customers, depending on, some customers are going to drive much less than the range that's going to be um, um, provided in an electric vehicle. So they're not going to have any range anxiety. Um, others are going to you know, be a little bit more anxious because they're used to being able to, if they do run out of fuel, you know, fill up within two minutes. I, I think one of the ways that, that we at Ford are really going to try to uh, address range anxiety is, is to make sure that our information system in the vehicle is to a point where customers know all the time, again, how much range they, they, they're actually gonna have. And the cool thing about our product when it comes out, depending on how you're driving, it's gonna be able to tell you what range you actually have remaining. That's number one. Secondly, we're really looking to partner with some, some information um, organizations that are going to have availability of electric charging stations. So if you're out, you're gonna to wanna to know, whoa, where are the electric charging stations? Is there anybody at those stations? How far are they? Am I gonna be able to get to those stations? Having that information in a vehicle will also help out uh, to um, you know, minimize that range anxiety. A couple questions here from Live Eco. 